Good morning, boys and girls. Thanks for joining us again today for our next adventure. Now we are heading out west of Kansas over to the state of California. We are now going to be in the Joshua Tree National Park, and we have Ranger Sarah Jane with us, and I'm going to um, send it over to her, and I can't wait to learn about your park. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Kristen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Joshua Tree National Park. As Kristen mentioned, Joshua Tree National Park is in, whoa, my camera's being a little crazy. Sorry, team. As Kristen mentioned, Joshua Tree National Park is in the state of California. So uh, we, I understand our, you guys are in Kansas, which is here in the middle of the country. The direction west is this way, and California is this big, long state on the west coast of California. So I'm going to switch my map here. We know where California is now, so let's take a closer look. This map is of the state of California, and on this map we have some big green shapes. All of these big green shapes are national parks in California. We've got some really famous ones in California. This one kind of in the middle of the state is called Yosemite National Park. Make a letter Y with your fingers if you've heard of Yosemite National Park. That's a super famous one. We've got a gigantic national park here on the side of California. That one's called Death Valley National Park. Touch your shoulders if you'd like to visit a place called Death Valley National Park. Look around your classroom. There's probably some brave folks tapping their shoulders right now. It's not called Death Valley because people die if they go there. It's called Death Valley because it gets super hot there in the summer. One summer, they had a high temperature of 134 degrees Fahrenheit. That is really hot. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, down here in the bottom, this one's neat. This one is Joshua Tree National Park. We are the southernmost national park in the whole state of California. It's about two hours for us to drive to the ocean. So this is the city of Los Angeles. That's where they make all those big Hollywood movies. Down here is the city of San Diego. You might've heard of that beachside city. So we are about two hours driving to the ocean, but this place is very different from the ocean. There's some big mountains between the ocean and where Joshua Tree National Park is. And that means that this place is a desert. Okay, take your finger. Find someone else in your classroom, touch it to their, your, touch your fingers to their finger and ask that person, what makes a place a desert? Just take one minute here to ask someone in your classroom, what makes a place a desert? We're going to come back together in just a little bit here. All right, so we probably have a lot of uh, answers in the chat. I'm so sorry, students, I'm new to this platform, so I can't see your answers, but I bet some of you put that something that makes a place a desert are the plants and animals that live there. Like maybe some of you said, cactus or lizards or snakes. Another thing that lots of times kids say makes a place a desert are special landforms like sand dunes or mesas. I've had a lot of people said a thing that makes a place a desert is the temperature. How hot or cold a place is is really uh, an important factor in how scientists define a desert. And then finally, the most important thing that makes a place a desert is water, or more specifically, a lack of water. Deserts are places that get less than 10 inches of rain or snow every year. Here at Joshua Tree National Park last year, I think we got about four, four total inches of rain and snow for the whole year. <laughs> All living things need water to survive, and deserts are places where there's not very much water. So today we're gonna to learn about how plants and animals live in a place where there's very little water. <clears throat> First, let's do a quick test of our own selves. We are human beings and we are alive. So we need water to survive. 
take your tongue and move it around inside your mouth. So all around your cheeks and your teeth. Hopefully it feels wet inside there. <laughs> if you feel your body on the outside, your hands, your arms, your skin probably feels dry. This is how living things work. Even though they might be dry on the outside, they have moisture on the inside that fuels their bodies and keeps them healthy. Now we know humans have to drink liquid water every day in order to stay healthy. The plants and animals that live in the desert almost never have a chance to drink liquid water. There's no rivers here. There's no lakes. There's just maybe three or four seeps or springs where there's water underground that comes to the surface. So most desert plants and animals have super limited access to water. When a plant or an animal has something special about it that helps it live in its environment, scientists call that an adaptation. Make a letter A with your hands if you've already learned about adaptations in school. <laughs> an adaptation is something that helps a plant or an animal thrive wherever it lives. So today we're talking about desert adaptations. We're going to talk about how plants and animals cope with how little water there is here. The other thing that they have to cope with is the temperature. It does get very hot here in the summertime and very cold in the wintertime. You probably notice that I am wearing my jacket. All living things have a temperature that they are happiest at. It's a little cold for me over here in the shade. So since it's colder than the temperature I'm happy at, I put my coat on. <laughs> for the plants and animals that live in the desert, they don't have the chance to put their jacket on, but they do have ways of coping with how hot it gets here in the summer and how cold it gets here in the winter. We'll learn about those adaptations too. Okay, the first desert living thing that we're gonna cover is the namesake of this park. Kristen said this is called Joshua Tree National Park. And we are looking right now at a picture of a Joshua tree. These Joshua trees grow all throughout the Mojave Desert. So Joshua Tree National Park is not the only place that you can find Joshua trees, but there are about 2 million of them living here. <laughs> you can see in the background, we have a whole bunch of Joshua trees at Joshua Tree National Park. Now they uh, have the name Joshua Tree, and I bet there's some people out there who either are named Joshua or maybe have a friend or a family member named Joshua. People named Joshua are always super curious why it's called a Joshua tree. The name Joshua tree comes from some pioneers. They were crossing the desert in a, in a wagon train and they were really hot and really tired. And they had been reading a story and in the story, there was a character named Joshua. And the character named Joshua in this story, the pioneers were reading, welcomed some travelers to their new home. So the real travelers saw for the first time way off in the distance, a plant that had, oh no, my camera's zooming in on me. A plant that had one trunk and an arm sticking out to the side. And it reminded them of the character from their story, Joshua. And they started calling that plant the Joshua tree. There's lots of names for these plants. The Kawea people and indigenous people to this area call Joshua trees Umi Chawa. I'll put that name in the chat so Kristen can share it with you all. Umi Chawa. <laughs> I'm gonna sound it out while I'm typing. There we go. Umi Chawa is the Kawea name for the Joshua tree. Now Joshua trees have several special adaptations that help them cope with the conditions where they live. Let's use our hands to make a model <laughs> of some of these adaptations. So warm your hands up, spin your wrist around. We're gonna use our hands and our fingers. <clears throat> okay, so we use a model, scientists use a model to illustrate something that happens naturally. The thing that we're gonna illustrate using our hands are the shapes of leaves on trees. So the first leaf shape we're gonna make with our hand is, let's do an oak leaf. You have oak trees that grow in Kansas. An oak leaf is a solid flat leaf. So I've got my hand up here and I hope you do too. I'm imagining that my hand is a big flat oak leaf and my arm is like a little twig. Once you've got your oak leaf out, let's illustrate a natural phenomenon that happens to oak trees. Rain falls on their leaves. Get your other hand out and model some rain drops falling on the oak leaf. 
when the raindrops hit the oak leaf, something's going to happen to the oak leaf and something's going to happen to the raindrops. Usually the raindrops push down on the leaf and then they slide off and go into the ground. That is really good for oak trees because they have deep roots in the ground that wanna suck up water. So when it rains on an oak leaf, the raindrops push the leaf down, they slide off the slippery surface and they end up on the ground. Let's model another leaf shape. Let's do pine needles. I'm gonna stick just a few of my fingers out here because pine needles are like long skinny leaves. And now I'm gonna do that same thing. I'm gonna model some raindrops falling on my pine needles. So if you've got a few fingers sticking out, have some raindrops come down to them and let's see what happens. I don't wanna show you yet. I bet you're doing it in class. <laughs> okay, so sometimes students show me that the raindrops go right between the pine needles. They're so skinny that they don't even hit the pine needles. Sometimes students show me that the raindrops hit the pine needles and push them down. The raindrops are gonna fall onto the ground which is really good for pine trees because again, they wanna use their roots to suck up water from the ground. Now let's think about a Joshua tree. Joshua trees do not grow in forests. They grow in the desert. And the ground here, I'm gonna bend down and get some for you. <laughs> the ground here, oh my gosh, this camera, so sorry students. The ground here is super sandy. It's rocky. It's got big chunks of rock in it. So when it rains here, the droplets of water go right through the sand. They run off really quickly and we get what's called flash floods. Flash floods happen because when it rains here, all of the water moves so fast through the particles of sand, it rushes down to low areas. After it's done raining, there's no shade to keep the sand wet. When it's done raining, the sun comes up and the sand dries out super quickly. That means there's not enough time for big plants like Joshua trees to use their roots to suck up water from the ground. So they have an adaptation, which is using their leaves to collect water before it ever hits the ground. Okay, students, I'm gonna try to back away from the camera. We wanna make a model of a Joshua tree leaf together. For this one, you're gonna need both your hands, put all of your fingers together, and then put your pinkies together with your hands facing you. You should have your hands kind of cupped in front of you. Next, you're gonna pull your elbows together and really glue your forearms together. Then put your elbows against your body, kind of by your belly button. <laughs> okay, students, we should all have one Joshua tree leaf. And you can probably imagine if the teacher turned on your fire sprinklers right now, any water that fell on your hands would end up right down your pants, right? <laughs> what Joshua trees have is basically a water slide for raindrops. So any rain that falls on the leaves goes straight into the trunk and the branches. I have a little piece of a Joshua tree here. I'm gonna show you the inside of it. <laughs> it is fishy. This is a piece that got trimmed off a tree, so it's all dried out. But if it had water in it, I could wring it out like a sponge. Joshua trees store water inside their branches and trunk, and they get that water when it rains before the rain ever hits the ground. So they're using all of their leaves to collect water before the, the water goes into the soil. Joshua trees have funny shapes because that water that's up in their branches is really heavy. Imagine students, if you're holding a big jug of water, and you were trying to balance, you would spread your arms out to try to deal with the weight. That's why Joshua trees grow in funny shapes because they have heavy branches that are trying to hold on to the weight of that water. Okay, I'm ready to go for a little hike. I bet you are too. We are gonna walk up and see a Joshua tree and there's also a baby Joshua tree growing right next to it. I wanna show you both of them. I'm gonna put my mic on mute and I want you to turn to that person you talked to earlier as we're walking, just ask that person, what do they notice? What do they see as we're hiking around? Okay, I'm gonna take off the stand, try to be as stable as possible. Here we go.
Okay, students, I made it up the hill. Let's see if I can show you this little baby Joshua tree. <laughs> this little baby Joshua tree. See a lot of the top of a pineapple. <laughs> it has these leaves sticking straight up out of the ground. It kind of looks like a buried pineapple. This little baby Joshua tree is maybe three or four years old. They grow pretty slowly in the beginning of their life because they can't store very much water. They need to have uh, more of a, a trunk and branches to be able to store water inside them, and then that will help them grow a little faster. Another adaptation that has to do with the Joshua tree's leaves are the covering of its trunk. So I'm going to get really close to this big Joshua tree. <laughs> We're going to look up at the top, and we can see that the old dead leaves have folded down. Where they come off the branches, they're folding down to cover the outside of the branches and the trunk. The reason Joshua trees do this with their leaves is because they're standing out here in the middle of the summer. We don't get as hot as Death Valley, but usually in the summer, most days, it's like 105, 108 degrees here. And they have all that water inside their trunk and they don't want it to dry out. So they have this covering of old dead leaves that provides shade for the trunk. So if I had my thermometer in the summer and I stuck it out here and it was 108 degrees, when I nestle it underneath the bark of the, the old dead leaves of the Joshua tree, it's gonna be cooler in the inside <laughs> because it's not in direct sunlight. Another plant that we have growing up here, a classic desert plant, are cactus. So there's two types of adaptations that desert plants have. Either they're like a cactus or a Joshua tree, and they store water inside of themselves, or the other type of desert plant adaptation is like all these bushes. They look kind of, well, they look kind of dead. <laughs> They're not actually dead. They are just in a state of dormancy. This is kind of like when trees in the forest lose their leaves in the wintertime. Dying. They're just going to sleep for a few months. Desert plants do this to an extreme. These plants have been sleeping since last summer. In about a week or so, they're gonna wake up. They're gonna grow leaves, they're gonna flower, those flowers are gonna get pollinated and they're gonna produce seeds all before probably the end of May. And then they're gonna lose all their leaves again and they're gonna go back to sleep. So the two main adaptations that desert plants have are storing water inside themselves, like Joshua trees and cactus, or going to sleep when conditions aren't right for growing, like most of the bushes that you see here. Now, there are implications of those desert plant adaptations for the animals that live here. Because remember, there's no rivers and no lakes and no sources of liquid water for the animals. So most animals, like this desert cottontail rabbit, get all the water they need from the food that they eat. This would be kind of like, oh, let me get him in the sun so you guys can see him a little better. <laughs> Sorry, it's earlier this morning. There you go. We'll put some sun in him so you can see the cottontail rabbit. I'll step over here. Desert cottontail rabbits and most other desert animals get all the water they need from the food that they eat. This would be kind of like if you were really thirsty and instead of drinking water, you ate some grapes. <laughs> you would feel a little less thirsty because you can get some of the water you need from the food that you eat. For cottontail rabbits and, ooh, down here there's a lizard. See the lizard out on the rock? For cottontail rabbits and lizards and quail, they get all the water they need from the food that they eat. And what food are they eating? They're eating plants. <laughs> Remember, there's only some plants that store water inside themselves. Most of these plants are dormant for most of the year. So it is challenging for desert quail and lizards and cottontail rabbits to get the water that they need because they have to eat juicy food to find it. For animals that eat meat, like, ooh, who's over here? Let's turn him around. Here's a little burrowing owl. This is one of my favorite desert animals, the burrowing owl. Burrowing owls and, ooh, look, down there there's a fox. <laughs> For animals that eat meat, they also get most of the water they need from the food that they eat. But this means that when the fox is thirsty, he's not going to have somewhere to drink water. He's going to eat a nice juicy lizard. And then he'll get all the water 
from the food the lizard ate inside of his body. We have two species of fox in this park. We have gray fox and we have desert kit fox. We also have coyotes that live here. <laughs> Usually students are kind of curious about the animals or the canines that live in the park. Okay, we got one more animal hanging out down here. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> Here's the desert tortoise. Now, students, we know that most desert animals get the food, they get the water they need. So sorry, they, most desert animals get the water they need from the food that they eat. The desert tortoise is an exception. Desert tortoises have to drink liquid water at least once a year. <laughs> They hold that water inside their bodies in a special bladder for a whole year. They usually get their drink of water at the end of summer. So you get these big rainstorms at the end of summer. There's little puddles that form on the ground right after it rains. And the desert tortoises will come out and drink water from those puddles. That's the water that they store inside them for the rest of the year. This is one of the reasons that's really important to always give wild animals plenty of space. Humans are pretty scary to wild animals. You know, we, we walk on two legs and we wear clothes and talk on loud voices and smell like sunscreen and shampoo. And that's just really strange to wild animals. So when wild animals see humans, they feel a little afraid. When we're visiting the place that wild animals live at, we wanna give them plenty of space so that we don't scare them. If a desert tortoise gets scared, like maybe because someone gets too close to it, or especially if someone tries to like catch it or pick it up, if they feel super scared, they pee. <laughs> and it sounds kind of silly, but uh, this works well because if you, if somebody picks up a desert tortoise and they pee, they're usually like, oh, gross. And then they put it down. But for the desert tortoise, that water that they just peed out might be all the water they have for the rest of that year. They rely on environmental cues like humidity in the air to drink. So it's not like you could just put a bowl of water in front of them and they, they drink again. So it's really important that whenever we see wild animals, whenever we're visiting their home, to always give them lots of space so that we don't uh, scare them. Okay, team, I'm gonna head back to the stand. I know Kristen has been checking um, where you guys put your questions. So hopefully she has gathered some and I'll get you set up right back here at the stand and I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. Oh yes, we've got lots of questions that have come in. <clears throat> One of them, um, you may have mentioned it, but uh, it did come in a couple times. They want to know how tall can a Joshua tree get? Ooh, the tallest Joshua tree I know of in the park is around 40 feet tall. Oh, wow, that is tall. And then they want to know, do any of the animals like make their home inside of the Joshua tree at all? Yeah, sometimes animals make their home inside of Joshua trees, especially birds build nests in Joshua trees. But one time we saw a bobcat that had made its home in the crotch of a Joshua tree. It had two kittens up there and the kittens were safe up in the Joshua tree until they were big enough to climb down. Oh, wow. And then of um, the cactus that are in the park, um, what's the biggest one of the cactus you have around there? Do any of them grow like as tall as you or are they all pretty small? No, that's a great question. There are some really famous cactus you might have heard of. They're called saguaro cactus. They do not grow in California. They only grow east of the Colorado River. The cactus that we have here stay pretty small. We've got some barrel cactus that get, I don't know, maybe two or three feet tall. Uh, and then we have a really spiny cactus called the Choya cactus. And it grows branches. And there are a few of them that are a little taller than I am, but not too many of those. <laughs> they did have a question about the turtle. <clears throat> so the turtle um, that you showed us was pretty big. Um, are most of them like that big there or are they pretty small? That's a great question. So the animal that we saw was a desert tortoise. Turtles are shelled reptiles that swim in water. So they have flippers. Tortoises are shelled reptiles that live on land and they cannot swim. So we only have desert tortoises here. If you put them in a, a pond or something, they would sink right to the bottom. They can't swim at all. 
desert tortoises stay pretty small compared to other tortoises like Galapagos tortoises, which are really big, <laughs> but they can grow. I usually use my hat as an example. They usually don't get much bigger than my hat. They can be very old though. They can live to be more than 100 years old. When they're born, they hatch out of an egg that looks just like a ping pong ball. <laughs> and um, do any types of bears live in your park? No, there's no bears at Joshua Tree National Park. There's not enough food for them. That makes sense. Not a not a lot, not a a lot of space. I feel too for a a den. <laughs> there's a the right lot. type of yeah. Right this type is of a space. huge national park. We're a little bigger than the state of Rhode Island, and we have big mountains where animals, mountain lions, make their dens. Bears need a ton of calories, which they usually get from plants and small animals like fish. We don't have any fish here because we don't have any water. <laughs> um, they want to know some animals that live there, maybe like, um, was there anything, maybe like a bobcat, like a feline type animal? Yeah, we have bobcats and we have mountain lions that live here. We also have an animal that lives here named a ringtail cat. It's not actually a cat. It's closely related to a raccoon. But usually when people see it, when visitors see a ringtail cat in the park, they come in the visitor center and they ask if we have lemurs that live here. If you've seen the movie Madagascar, you know that lemurs live in a special place, an island in Madagascar. We don't have them in the desert, but ringtail mm -hmm. cats look a lot like those lemurs in the movie Madagascar. So if you see an animal that reminds you of that, that could be a ringtail cat. Oh, nice. And I think we have time for one more. This one's about you, actually. They want to, they think your job is pretty cool. So they kind of want to know, like, what steps does a person have to take to be a park ranger at a national park? Do you have sure. to go to school for that? My job is really cool. When I was in school, my favorite thing to do was to go on field trips. And now as park ranger, I go on field trips almost every day. <laughs> There's a lot of different park ranger jobs though. My job is kind of like a teacher. So I have an education background that's kind of like a teacher. I just pick to work outside and instead of in the school. There are some park rangers who are scientists and they went to college to study wild animals, especially the park rangers who study desert tortoises or the other animals in the park. There are some park rangers that work on computers. Um, so they make the website and all the videos for social media. There are some park rangers that are kind of like police officers. They go to a special training uh, in order to be a law enforcement ranger in a national park. So there's a bunch of different jobs. If you think that you want to work in the outdoors, just whatever you're passionate about, I bet you can find a ranger job. Well, students, let's make sure that we say a big thank you to Kristen and Tana for helping us go on this field trip to Joshua Tree National Park. I want to say thank you so much for giving me the chance to talk to everybody. Oh, we're we should thank you. It's so it's so neat to see this type of a habitat that, you know, it doesn't look like where we live. So we are so appreciate you bringing that into our schools. OK, thanks, Kristen. Bye, everybody. Bye.